Imagine a speedway so fast that cars could race four times faster than anything we've seen before. PCI is just that. It will change personal computing forever. The vision is now reality. Speed and performance. The second decade has begun. In its simplest form, the PC consists of the microprocessor, the CPU, memory, and standard input-output for I.O. devices. The CPU accesses data in memory via the memory bus, which is designed to be very fast, matching the microprocessor speed. To access data in the outside world, disks, networks, displays, the CPU has to go through the standard I.O. bus. It is the existence of this bus that helped the PC evolve and succeed. It gave the PC its flexibility. But it wasn't designed for the taxing requir requirements of today's graphics-oriented software. Accessing data over the I.O. bus takes time. With relatively slow devices, just, uh, such as disks, the speed of the I.O. bus is adequate. But it isn't fast enough. It wasn't designed for the, for the purpose of moving around high-performance, high-resolution graphics. One way out of this problem is to use graphics boards that have their own memory and processors. But they are expensive and still don't help in cases where you need to display complex images. There is another simpler way. We can connect the graphics directly to the CPU memory bus. This eliminates the bottleneck and even simplifies the so software interfaces. And is also far cheaper to build things right onto the motherboard. The primary bottleneck in PC systems today has become the I.O. subsystem. As the CPU has migrated in frequency from 8 to 16, 25, 33 megahertz, the I.O. has remained locked in at 8 megahertz and as a result is not keeping up. So the primary problem we set out to solve was to find a way to bring that I.O. subsystem at 8 megahertz up to the CPU frequency of 33 megahertz. Well, that wasn't an easy, easy task because uh, we have already seen problems at the low 8 megahertz speeds. And that was because these plug-in cards uh, were never known how many of them are going to be in a system, so the designer could never terminate those traces properly. Yeah, it was really unpredictable. But fortunately, technology has worked in our favor over the last few years. Uh, when I started in the in industry, we built I.O. functions on boards about this size. Now, you can integrate all the circuitry down onto a sig single component. If we can get that kind of space savings, we could probably get the components a lot tighter together and possibly achieve the, the speeds that we want to. Putting them on the board that tight together would require controlling the environment. So the specification would have to look very closely at that environment. So the question then became, well, how many devices do we need to integrate onto the motherboard? And clearly, the foremost one is graphics. Uh, the graphics is exceeding the bandwidth and performance requirements today, and it's going to just get worse in the future. So that would be number one. Uh, in addition to that, just to get on the bus from the CPU and then off the bus to your slower I.O., you need another two devices there. So we're already at three devices. And it's become a trend now these days that people are starting to put uh, SCSI and LAN directly on the motherboard because those are common system components. And then thinking of the future, uh, we have seen the development of the uh, motion picture and the audio for the pieces, which add up some more loads to it. Hmm. So we've got anywhere from six to 10 devices. And as we set out to define the P PCI specification, uh, what we decided to do was target the 10 load system. And that way, it's much easier to build the, the lower load systems. And that'll ensure a long-term uh, application of the PCI spec. And that's really important that the I.O. subsystem have the breadth and be able to incorporate a lot of different devices, especially in the 90s as you see computer-supported collaboration become more and more the norm. There needs to be a standard in place that components can be built to that incorporates this wide system view and really the PC of the future. Um, we had to then take these components and figure out a way to take them and put them directly down on the motherboard. Now, these components today aren't built to handle driving an entire I.O. subsystem, 
So that was one of the biggest problems, was figuring out what exactly had to be in the component. Restrictions have to be understood on the component also in terms of how they would interconnect to 10 devices and making it easy for the system designer to do that is very important. So down in the, uh, in the design of PCI, what we had to do was thoroughly understand what was going on in the PC traces on the board as well as what the capabilities of the components that are built today are and try to coordinate those and come up with a cohesive specification that will propel us into the 90s without any problems. It was the subject of a lot of investigation. In order to investigate how PCI was going to work uh, with, with that high, heavy load environment that we described earlier, we, we built this uh, demonstration board or kind of an evaluation board to go in and be able to look electrically at what's going on when you run these type of common I.O. devices on an interconnect that involves 10 different traces. Really understanding what goes on at the electrical level has, uh, has often been mysterious to design engineers. Uh, now we have the capabilities to go in and actually simulate what's going on at the electrical level. To do that, we found a simulation package that would allow us to actually input the, the PC traces, in other words, their size, uh, their distance to ground planes, down to the, down to the thousandth of, of an inch level. To simulate that, create lossy transmission lines and actually fully characterize what we might see when we interconnect 10 loads together. The tool that we used to accomplish that task was HSPICE from MetaSoftware. Here we've shown the output of the HSPICE simulation. On this axis, we're looking at voltage, and on this axis down here, we're looking at time. The time is all in the nanosecond domain. The waveform shown here is actually a simulation of the driver connected directly to the 10 load environment. You can see right off the bat that this driver cannot switch the full potential. What we'd ideally like to happen is to have this waveform move from 5 volts here all the way down to 0 volts. But you can see that since the driver was not intended to work in this kind of environment, it only makes it down to about 2.5 volts. Not to worry, we're going to use that to our, in our, our advantage in just a second and I'll show you how. If I inject this waveform onto the line, it'll begin to travel throughout all the 10 loads. If I bring in the load that is, that is at the other end of the line, shown here in red, you can see that it took about four or five nanoseconds to move from the driver down to the other end of the line. Now, since we achieved half of the full voltage potential we needed, when we get to the far end of the line, we see essentially a brick wall and get a full reflection of that voltage level and achieve zero volts, which is what we want. Once we've done that, we can wait for that wave to propagate from the end of the line back to the driver, switching the entire 10 load environment on what we refer to as the reflected wave. If we can allow that, that much time as shown from here to here, and it's on the order of about 10 nanoseconds, if we can work that into the PCI specification, we can directly interconnect all the loads that we need to. Again, when we're talking about a, a cycle that is only 30 nanoseconds long, it's very important and critical that we allow for that 10 nanosecond uh, window of operation. If we can do that and we can build that into the uh, interconnect specification, then we'll find that, that we can connect these very weak drivers. PCI calls this reflected wave switching, and it's, it's kind of the, it's the key to how we managed to get uh, um, low current ASICs onto PCI. To see how we did, let's come over and look at the real board. This board may function as, as a view of what the PC might look like in the future. We have embedded down on the interconnect all the I.O. functions that we talked about earlier. Well, you can see here that these positions might be occupied by the I.O. functions of the future. Maybe multimedia, or LAN, or graphics, SCSI, audio, fax modem, you name it all coordinated in a very tight space and interconnected through what we refer to as the PCI speedway. The traces are, are, or the signals are propagating down the speedway and again, as I showed you earlier, reflecting back and coming back to the other side. So what I'll do is I'll hook, 
I'll hook in the oscilloscope and we'll take a look at what these traces look like in real life. Up here I have a Tektronix 6 gigahertz oscilloscope. In order to see how these waveforms would behave in real life, we implemented uh, actually a, a real 10 load board. Shown here is, are the same two signals that we just simulated, um, both the driver and the far end of the line. Here on this axis, you can see, again, the, the five volts up here and zero volts down here. That's what we want to achieve is that full transition. On this axis, again, there's time. We can go in directly and measure and see if the time delays were what we expected and predicted in HSPICE. Shown here, you have the driver switching the line again down to about two and a half volts, the, the signal propagating down to the far end of the interconnect and bouncing off, doing that reflected wave switching that we referred to earlier. Here, the voltage again travels back from this point back to the uh, originating driver, achieving the full voltage potential. You can see that the astounding part about this is how much these waveforms look, uh, look like each other. We'll now bring on the waveform that we saw from the uh, SPICE simulation and put that on top of our oscilloscope waveform. Now that we've built the capability to be able to simulate what is going to be realized in real hardware, we can go in and we can look at some of the corner cases or the worst case examples. In other words, what happens when the absolute weakest buffer is applied to the interconnect at the absolute lowest voltage and perhaps the longest trace. If we put all those things together, we can get the worst case values and specify those in, in the, the PCI specification. Well, once we understand the worst case and we've completely characterized that, the next thing to understand would be, would be what, there's 50 signals on PCI. What's going to happen as you start varying the loads and you start having different traces of different lengths? Well, we can take a look at that through something uh, HSPICE refers to as Monte Carlo analysis and do sort of a random approach and look at hundreds and thousands. We've actually analyzed over 100,000 different configurations and topologies. Now I'll bring up on the system and show you some of that output. We've gone in and actually looked up here. It shows we've done 100 different runs, 100 different possible configurations. Uh, we, what we had HSPICE do is automatically go down and measure the amount of time that it took to make that reflected wave transition that, that I was showing you. These are just different nanosecond delay values that we're measuring uh, to quite a, quite a fine detail. On this, on this axis over here, we're showing for this given time, in other words, 6.1 nanoseconds, we're showing how many runs had out of 100 had that total amount of time. This shows in this graph that nine of the runs were at 6.1 nanoseconds. But we need the specification to allow for some of these worst case scenarios that come occur out at this end. Doing this kind of analysis, we can make sure that we've covered all the different configurations that'll happen on a real PC board. Running behind me now are the different cases that we've gone in and investigated. Uh, we've got over 5,000 hours invested in, in spy simulation trying to understand all the different cases. What we've achieved in PCI is we've been able to now go down and simulate at the board level what's going on. That was absolutely critical to be able to understand the, the kind of phenomena that is going to impede our being able to function at 33 megahertz. That understood, then we can create the right specifications to make PCI stable, solid, reliable, and real. Intel's invested a lot of time and effort in understanding this problem and, and making sure that it works for all the different components and systems that want to, that want to get onto PCI. So PCI as a, as a vision can truly be realized in hardware, and I think that we'll see it this decade will be the decade of PCI. The vision of PCI was to bring a new generation of high performance capability to the personal computer. Electrical barriers have been removed. The specification is ready. The vision is now reality.